Okay, just give everyone a second to get seated here. <clears throat> we just want to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, it's, it's a great turnout. Uh, we really didn't know what to expect, and, and we know a lot of people were reaching out and just wanting to remember Joanne. And so I think this is a great time that those who loved her could gather together to remember her and to pay our respects. I think it's also a good time where we could say goodbye. And also, it's a good time where we can just grieve and mourn, and it's okay to do that. Over the past 10 years, I've done the funerals of uh, Joanne's father-in-law and mother-in-law and husband. We all did them just down the street at Foster's Funeral Home. And uh, the last funeral, I made a joke that if we got one more in our Foster's punch card, that we would have earned ourselves a free one. So, you know, I was talking to them the other day on the phone, making arrangements with Foster's Funeral Home, and they don't make such arrangements. <laughs> I told them about the history, and, and they said, listen, sir, we don't have such a program, and uh, we don't honor group discounts, which I thought was silly. But that's why we are gathered in this place today, a place that does you know, uh, honor a discount for those who are in need. It's the church where I preached my first sermon and where, where Joanne came and, and, and watched me uh, with uh, Grandma Greta, and that was just wonderful to see. And I, I make that humor because I know that Joanne would appreciate humor because she appreciated my humor, and uh, she always uh, appreciated a good laugh. And some of you may be thinking that perhaps it's, uh, strange or inappropriate that a reverend would joke on such an occasion. But I do it to make a point too, and that is that we all have to grieve in our own way. Some people need to cry, uh, some people need to laugh, and some people get angry. And I think in a way, all those things sort of provide a release. And so my encouragement when I do funerals is to say, you know, no judgment. Everyone needs to grieve in the way that's comfortable for them. So don't think to yourself, like, stop being such a downer, you know, you, you know, stop crying, you're bringing everyone down, or why would that person dare laugh at a funeral? Let everyone have their way and do it, and say goodbye in their own way, and to grieve in their own way, for it is a process, and everyone has their own process. Let's remember this is a time of remembrance, and for some, it will also be a time of life celebration. Some it will be a time to grieve, others to cry. And so let's be sensitive to others and let us just handle it in the way that we have to. My only suggestion would be that you resist the temptation to avoid. You know, sometimes I think in our Canadian culture, we're so quick to try to avoid feelings of awkwardness or feelings that make us uncomfortable. And so we want to kind of move to a shallower place. We want to talk about the weather or how we got here or what we've been up to lately. But I would say if you don't take the time now to embrace the situation, then when are you going to do it? This is the time. This is the place. And so, yeah, it may feel uncomfortable, but, but embrace it. My friends, life is nothing if it ain't suffering. And there's a lot of suffering. It is the necessary suffering of life. Some would say a suffering is the program of life. You can't avoid it. So my suggestion is to embrace the suffering. Go into it. Let it wash over you. That's the only way you get relief. And if you try to stuff it or avoid it, it'll never go away. And so let us share with each other today our favorite memories of Joanne. Let us laugh about her, cry about her. Let us share with each other what we liked best about her. Talk about what we'll miss the most. And talk about how much it hurts that we're never going to see her again. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, it's in times like these 
that we don't know why you allow such tragedy to befall us. Sometimes we don't know why it is that you take some earlier than others, some that we may feel is before their time. But still we trust that even though we don't know, we know that you still love us. For how can you who died for us do anything else but love us entirely? So give us faith during this tough time, oh Jesus. Draw near to us, provide us peace, and please comfort us. Let us know that you are near us. Amen. <clears throat> now I'd like to begin today with a traditional funeral reading from the Bible. It comes from Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Amen. I would now like to invite up Joanne's daughter, my wife, Lacey Jo, who will be giving the eulogy. Good evening, I'm Lacey Jo. Do you have my eulogy up here? <laughs> have it. <laughs> oh, okay. So if there is one thing that everybody here knows about my mom is that she had an amazing sense of humor. She was quick-witted and she was clever. I loved making my mom laugh. You know, all it took was like one witty remark and she'd keep it going with side-splitting comebacks. I used to love just listening to mom and Carrie banter back and forth with their endearing jesting. And it brought me so much joy. So, I will miss this most about my mom. Now, the next thing I'm sure that everyone here knows about my mom is that she could sing. Now, she did not sing with a quiet, timid voice, for I don't think there's anything quiet or timid about my mom. But she sang with power, and she sang with passion, and she sang with soul. And when Chase and I were kids, <laughs> I remember a common phrase heard between us was, oh man, mom's singing again. <laughs> but it wasn't until I was older that I could fully appreciate my mom's talent and recognize just how incredibly gifted she was. I will also miss this most about my mom. Now, I'd like to share with you five life lessons that my mom taught me. Okay. First, if bullies threaten your son, <laughs> it is okay to hide behind garbage cans after school, catch the bullies in the act, and drag them to your house by their ears and give them a good old talking to. <laughs> yeah, you were there. <laughs> All right, lesson number two. If you catch your child smoking, the best way to deter them from this habit is to have your offspring smoke until they throw up. Then blow a bit of your own cigarette smoke in their direction as they're vomiting. <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> Third, when buying pets for your children, one is never enough. 
you need at least three. Four. And some of you older ones are going to know what I'm talking about because you all learned this life lesson with my mom. Now, to ensure the best rafting adventure, you must capsize the boat a minimum of two times or else it's not a real adventure. You will want to invest in a wide variety of coolers for you will never see them again because they went down the river. <laughs> and remember, the more people who fall out of the raft, the merrier. Now lastly, it is best to keep your new oil paints up high if you have small children and perhaps your suitcases too for you may have a clever son who will stack the suitcases to make a staircase, open your new oil paints, share them with their sister, and joyfully paint each other on Christmas Day in their brand new holiday outfits. <laughs> now, my mom, she was a beautiful and talented woman. I loved her so much. She was my best friend. So who will forever remain in my heart? But I will hold on to and I will cherish these memories. Today we buried her with her best friend and husband, Carrie. And they are finally at peace with each other. And I take comfort in knowing that they are forever united. I would now like to invite uh, Barb Bath to come up and say a few words. And then uh, when she is done, just to extend an open invitation uh, to anyone who would like to come up and, and say a few words about Joanne or to Joanne. So why don't you come up now, Barb? Hi. I didn't have anything formally prepared for Joe, but I'm just going to wing it because i got a lot of nice things to say about her. Actually, I'll start out with that rafting trip. That's when Joe and I bonded because we almost died. That's the closest we both ever came to death. So that's when we really bonded. She was so awesome and funny, and uh, her and I loved each other from the moment we laid eyes on each other, and I really miss her. And she was so talented, and I'm sorry I'm shaking and freezing. Um, I just missed her. I can't believe that this is where I've come to say goodbye to her. I thought she'd always be around. But I miss you, Joe, and I love you. Thank you. Hi. My name's Genevieve, but... I was called the bookend. There was a friend we lost, Brad. He said to me, he says, you have to meet this woman one day. I swear to God, you guys are bookends. So we went on staying friends and knowing that our friend Brad, who we lost a while back, always told us that we were bookends. So we had to stay together. We had to keep in contact with each other. And that's all. We were bookends. <laughs> I guess we looked alike, and he used to say we were both crazy. And uh, yeah, I'm really going to miss her. Chase, I'm the eldest. My mom always used to tell me I was the first, I was the baby. <sighs> Wonderful mother. Like Lacey said, I had some bullies when I was a kid. And if she did that nowadays, she probably would end up in jail. <laughs> 
butt that showed her. You know, she was, she was the mama bear, and somebody messed with the cub. And it didn't matter who, when, how old we were, she always thought of us as the little, the little teeny tots you know, that she gave birth to. I had her come live with me after Carrie's death. Try to get her back up on her feet. But as everyone know, that she loved Carrie so much. Those two is pure love, you know, and the world needs more of what that they had together. She's never the same. She couldn't kick it. She loved them, and it drove her nuts. But she was a wonderful woman. He said, Jub Jubs was her life. It was her baby, other than me and Lacey. She loved that place. It was three years and nothing but pure fun. And as me being the eldest, she always told me, I'm not letting you in. I'm not letting you come a drinker like us. But after a while of me going there, and I was working with a couple of the regular pipeline guys, we grew a bond. And we, that was probably some of the closest time that we got. Being, being a teenager, me and Lacey butted heads like any sibling would. But so much, I, I had to go move with my dad. And so I lost, didn't have that connection. But like I said, when we three years of Jub Jubs, had that connection, we kind of grew our bond together. And it, it, it broke her heart. And it broke Carrie's heart too. They wanted that place to work out so much. But they loved it, and they never regretted any minute of it. And they, they would do it again in a heartbeat, and everyone here would know, knows that. You know, it almost turned into the King Henry, turning into such a blues band, bar. It was turning it was phenomenal. Mu- three days a week, music, live music. And as everyone knows, Mom and Carrie lived off of music. <sighs> but they're happy now. They're together. And they can rest in peace. Thank you. I'm Ross. It's good to see all of you, kind of. You're, you're kind of fog, foggy. That's my eyes going on. I was, uh, I was thinking of, of a couple straight up stories. With the urn going in the ground, I I put one story in there. How can you pick one or two stories? Um, From the first time I met uh, Sammy and Megan, And Shauna and the crew and Bill and uh, what the hell was his name? I knew I was going to do that. Lee. I knew it'd come to me. Um, and then Joe. Uh, you know, I don't know how old she was. 14, 15 years old. And, that's a long time ago, a long time ago, and a lot of stories. She would just stir the pot, to stir the pot, 
and I'm serious. I know what Lacey's giggling about is one of the stories this is about in my home, um, Saturdays used to be, come on over, and Big John would bring his three little kids, and there'd be food on, chili or spaghetti, and Joe and uh, Carrie would come over, or Randy. And the ship was up on my wall, and she, she'd start in saying, if the flag was going that way, that means the ship was going that way. And then somebody else would say, that's not right, Joe. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Until they were all drunk and all had their yapping. You know, right down to the first in, last out. It has to be going that way. But everybody did love her. And there was a guitar to be played and poker to be played. And she was in on everything. A funny story. <laughs> um, if we were sitting at the King Eddie, or just name another bar. Um, we're sitting there, and the guys would be, not the people we were with, but the other guys would be swooping around her. She was pretty. She was goddamn pretty. Sorry. Um, and we're sitting back, so you have that, or we're, we're not, Standing up to nothing, you, you want it, you get it. Because she was the meanest one at the table. <laughs> She'd give the guy a goddamn whack before you could stand up and give her a hand. So between that and, and telling tales of, or making of tales, it was, uh, when she came in, you knew it was going to be a good day, a super day. We all loved her. We did. We all loved her very much. Um, and I loved the kids so much. Yeah, and the, and the love of these folks that are here, there's hundreds of others. You know, you talk about uh, jobs and Carrie's band and bandmates and the tales, if the walls could talk, you know, would, en would end up saying, Man, she's more of a part of this place than a lot of people. I would just, you know, I could go on for hours, but I can't. Some of those are mine. They're mine to keep, maybe to write down and send them off to Lacey. Um, but I did love her so, and that's a friend. So thank you for giving me 10 minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Roscoe, uh, for sharing that. And, and I, I wanted to share a few words about <clears throat> Joanne too, and then, and then I'll, 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 I'll leave it open then for people to come up because I know how this is sometimes, you know, you really feel like you want to say something, but then you're not sure. And then and you think the guy, oh, the guy got up again, I missed my opportunity, but I'm going to give you another opportunity. So if you're feeling like it, there'll be another opportunity. 
So I want to talk about Joanne and what she meant to me. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I, I did preach my first sermon from this pulpit. And uh, she came out and she brought uh, Grandma Greta with her. And you know, it's probably one of the only times she ever stepped foot in a church. And I think that's what really touched me about it, is that like, you know, she cared, right? That she was willing to do that, even though it wasn't her thing. And I think she supported me because, you know, as Chase said, like, she believed in, like, true love. And I think that's what she saw in us, Lacey. She knew that uh, her daughter had found true love, and so if th- that guy's into church stuff or whatever, it, <laughs> the God thing, even if I'm not into that, you know, I'm going to support him, and I'm going to be there for him. And that really touched me. She believed in me because she believed in love. And I don't think I've ever met anyone that loved anyone like she loved Carrie. As you know, like, we went through that. Um, Just seeing how much his loss affected her, you know. um, It's funny how they say when one goes, then the, the other one's not far behind. When there's true love there. I think she passed that committed love on to Lacey Jo. For that, I'm very thankful to Joanne. But Joanne also passed on her stubbornness. Her fire. <laughs> it's, true. it's true. Her fiery passion. I now see that as she's a mom. And lack of discretion, complete lack of discretion. For these things, I'm less thankful. <laughs> see, Joanne always said exactly what was on her mind. Regardless of the person or the situation, it's not that Joanne was any more sinister than anyone else. It's just that she didn't bother at all to hide it. And now I know that that turned some people off, but for me, I always saw it as a breath of fresh air because there was no posturing. There uh, was no pretending. You know, with Joanne, you always knew exactly what you were getting. You always got what you deserved. I call this genuine, and that's always how I'm going to remember her. So I'm going to open up again, if anyone else would like to say some words. Hi, everyone. I'm Shannon, and first time I met Joe. Um, I work next door to Jub Jubs, and I walked in to introduce myself, and she was up on a ladder decorating for the grand opening. And so I said, well, let me help you, and we instantly bonded. There was Indian leg wrestles, and (laughs) um, she used to sing a song that I loved called Suzanne, and I'd have to beg her and coax her, and then It would spurt out when I least expected. One time we went to Drumheller together to watch a band and we wound up in the Last Chance Saloon and we had this little tiny single bed. But it didn't really matter because we stayed up all night laughing. It was the Thelma and Louise trip. She helped me with my will. She took a bird that I, a bird that was taken didn't have a home, and just carrying her and the kids, just nurtured and loved this bird so much. And they were such a wonderful family. We had so many great times together, and I'm gonna miss her so much. I'm just so glad that we're all here because we empower each other. and It's just gonna make this loss a little bit easier for all of us, I think. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Ed, and kind of knew Joanne for quite a few years, and lots of different experiences. She liked to have a few parties, and well, that's where I met her. Is through a friend of hers, Diane Nickleby, and it was like back in I think I was 17, so it's almost it's over 40 years ago, somewhere in there. But anyways, she was always good for the jokes, like everybody says, and. The Indian rig leg wrestling is kind of good. Because uh, we'd take Kerry out to the bar one time with us, and he says, oh, you guys, I can't drink any more beer today. Kerry, okay? So he says, you guys, go get Joanne and take her out. Drop me off, and I'm going to go have a nap. So, well, we drag Joanne over to the pig and whistle, and we get there, and we're talking with this guy, an athletic guy. He's... Uh, NHL player, right? He's going to be on the flames, maybe. Well, he says, I can Indian leg wrestle you to the ground. I says, I says, this chick, she can Indian leg, leg wrestle you. And well, she kicked his butt three times and took him for 200 bucks. <laughs> so it was quite funny. And, you know, she's always, like I said, she's always good for a joke. Okay, well, with, Kind of, this is when they bought the house in Beddington, and I was over there and had a, had a nap and got up and was having a cigarette in the middle of the night at the table and didn't turn on any lights just to have a smoke. And out comes Joanne, and she's buck naked. So she bends over to get something out of the fridge, and she turns around, and she goes, oh, Ed. I says, no problem, Joe. So she's walking around thinking, I'm telling everybody I've seen her naked. And this went on until he got Jub Jubs opened. We're sitting in Jub Jubs one night, and she says, Oh, Eddie here, he's seen me naked. And everybody says, Have you seen her naked? And I says, Not that I know. And she says, You did so. And I says, I never told anybody. And she goes, Really? I says, Yeah, the joke was on you because me and Carrie talked about it. <laughs> so it was kind of fun. I could stay here all night because I did know her for quite a few years. And I know the two sitting right here, when I first met, Chase and Lacey. Well, Joanne says, come on over to our house. We're having a barbecue. We're having some people. Come on over and have a few drinks, but don't drive home. So I says, no, well, I ain't driving home then. Well, I have a nap on the couch. And, well, I woke up in the morning. Oh, gee, this is kind of strange. How come it's so heavy? You know? So I look, and here's Chase and Lacey. They're in their pajamas watching Saturday morning cartoons, eating cereal, and it's going all over the place. But, you know, it was kind of funny. So it's always been a joy and a pleasure to be around Joanne. So you all have a good night, and maybe we'll toss one later for her. Actually, just as you said that, I was reminded of um, a time maybe about four years ago when Joanne happened to be staying with us for a time, and it was just over Christmas. So I thought I'd invite her over to my family, uh, Christmas gathering with the paquettes. And my family, oh, my family's a, l a little bit more straight-laced, I guess. So, you know, she was, she was a fun addition to the whole thing. And we do... You know, and uh, I was like, hey, you know, let's roll, let's roll the dice. Let's see what happens here. So it was, it's an overnight thing. We have to drive up to St. Paul, uh, Alberta. And uh, we do, uh, every year we have a tradition, we do like a white elephant gift exchange. But we do it where you can like steal and stuff. And there was one item of real value that came up. It was like this birdhouse. Remember that? And uh, she wanted it. But someone stole it from her. And she was like, I want that birdhouse. And I remember she slapped my cousin in the face <laughs> over the birdhouse. And we were like, this is part of the tradition. And, and, nor and normally, <laughs> she was upset. And I know normally the, like, the Paquette Christmas, like, it winds down around like 10 or 11 or anything. And we had come down because we had to put the kids down or something. It was like, and then we, we tried to go to sleep and we got up. And, I, 
and it was like one or two in the morning and everyone was still up and there was a group of them and they were leg wrestling in the living room. And I was like, what has happened to my family? We're leg wrestling in the uh, living room at two in the morning. But, you know, that's a, that was Joanna, right? She's always the life of the party and um, always brought a lot of laughter and happiness wherever she went. And, I mean, my family loved her and they wanted her back. You know, they wanted her back. So, anyways, last call. Uh, just put your hand up if you'd like to say any words. Um, okay. <laughs> well, at this point, um, the minister in a funeral service usually is supposed to provide some words of comfort to family and friends. Um, but all I can offer is the comfort that I have for myself. So what I have, I offer you. I know that Joanne, uh, she really didn't want anyone to make a big fuss about her when she passed. She didn't want people going through all the trouble of a funeral and all that stuff. I think that's because, honestly, she cared too much about other people to inconvenience them. I think she felt guilty of that sometimes she made things harder on people, and she didn't want that in her death. And that's admirable. She loved others. But also, I think it's because she didn't think she deserved such a fuss. But I believe, as the Bible tells me, that all people have intrinsic, enormous value because each one of us was created by God. So I think Joanne has immense value. I think she is worth all of the fuss that we could ever put up for her. Because God put up a fuss for her. Because God sent his only son to die for Joanne. He considered Joanne worthy enough of the price of his own son. That's how worthy she is. She's a child of God. We're all children of God. And so I believe that she has value in life and in her death. See, Jesus didn't just die for the faithful and the clean of heart, but he died for the broken, the messy, and yes, even the angry drunks. Jesus lived a sinless life on our behalf because he knew that we could not do that by ourselves. Joanne couldn't. I couldn't. So when we get to the pearly gates, I don't think he's going to play back a tape recording of all the bad things that we've done and all the people we hurt. I think he's going to give us a choice and an opportunity to choose to take Jesus' life for our own, to claim it as our own, his perfect life. We will have a choice. And so when my youngest daughter asked me if grandma's in heaven, I did tell her, I said, I don't know. Because who can know such things? No one can know such things. However, I do believe that today is not goodbye forever. I do believe I will get to speak to her again someday. And I so much look forward to that day. There will now be uh, a solo, uh, Amazing Grace, sung by Andrea. Um, so I'll invite her up at this time. And that's going to be followed by a video slideshow. I believe Joanne used to sing Amazing Grace, right? A lot. So it's a special song to the family. Just first of all, I just didn't want to come up two times in a row, but I just remember always going over. I used to live right across the street from Chase and Lacey growing up. Um, I remember going into the smoke-filled room and her just jamming on her guitar, just belting it out. That was like... Every single time, that's what I expected from her, every moment that I stepped into the house. So, Joanne, I hope I make you proud. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch
snares I have already come. Twas grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace shall His horse and his cattle are his only companions. He works in the saddle and he sleeps in the canyons, waiting for summer, his pastures to change. And as the moon rises, he sits by his fire, thinking about women and glasses of beer. Closing his eyes as the doggies retire He sings out a song which is soft but it's clear As if maybe someone could hear Good night you moonlight ladies Rocked up by sweet baby Jane are the colors I choose Won't you let me go down in my dreams And rock a bar sweet baby James Now the first of December was covered with snow So was the turnpike from Stockbridge to Boston Though the Berkshires seem dreamlike on account of that frosting With ten miles behind me and ten thousand more to go There's a song that they sing when they take to the highway A song that they sing when they take to the sea A song that they sing of their home in the sky Maybe you can believe it if it helps you to sleep But singing works just fine for me So good night, you moonlight ladies Rock up by sweet baby Jane Beat greens and blues are the colors I choose won't you let me go down in my dream And rock up our sweet baby Jane Take the ribbon from my hair Shake it loose and let it fall Laying soft against your skin Like the shadows on the wall Come and lay down by my side Till the early morning light all I'm taking is your time Help me make it through tonight I don't care what's right or wrong and I won't try to understand Let the
Isn't it sad to be alone? Help me make it through the night. I don't want to be alone. Help me make it through the Dear Father, God of eternity, life is so precious for each of us that everything within us says no to death. We see death as the dark, mysterious enemy that destroys the good that you have created. But help us to see death as you see it, not as the end, but the beginning, not a wall, but a doorway, not a dark road, but a path that leads to eternal light and life. We will miss our loved one, Joanne, but we thank you, Lord, for the memories. May our minds and hearts be filled with the wonderful recollections of the past. Help our sadness. Help our sadness to wear a smile as the passing of time wipes away the tears. Time can be a great physician, healing the void that we now feel. Every life is a gift from you, dear Father. Thank you for sharing her life with us. We will cherish her memory forever. Amen. This time I'd like to just express my deepest gratitude for all of you who have taken time to be here today and to show your love and to show how much you cared for Joanne. Please feel free to stick around here for a bit to just reminisce about Joanne. And for those of you who are interested, we'll be heading out to uh, Boston Pizza close by here in Beddington. And there we have a section reserved in the lounge. We encourage you to come there to share your memories about her, your laughter, your tears. And there's going to be a book also there that's going to be passed around by Lacey. And she would just so appreciate it if you could uh, write down some memories that you have of her and some goodbyes. In the future, if anyone is interested in uh, visiting Joanne, uh, she is uh, buried with Carrie, uh, her husband, just over here in the Queens Park Cemetery. And if you call there, they can get you the information. So again, thank you all for joining us today. May we remember her and remember her well. Go in peace. <laughs>